<laughs> Never in my life did I think that I was going to be cancer. <laughs> I'm just waiting for people to not be um, uh, Because uh, do Satanists don't believe in Satan. I mean, Anton LaVey, who invented the Church of Satan in the 60s, he didn't even believe in Satan in the devil. Because if you believe in Satan, you necessarily have to believe in God. Because you can't have hell without heaven. And you can't contemplate the greatest good without also contemplating the greatest evil. And if you want to freak your parents out, you like some black candles, you talk about decapitation, and you say, Hail Satan at the dinner table. <laughs> truthfully, the people I, truthfully, the Satanists I know, are way more familiar with the Bible than most Christians I know. Uh, I have a theory for this. The, the, my theory is as follows. Um, Christians ask certain people to interpret the Bible for them. This is called church. <laughs> and this is because they're looking for community and life advice. Satanists read the Bible for themselves because they're looking for contradiction and loopholes. <laughs> now, I, I'm not a Satanist. I don't believe in Satan, but I do donate to the Satanic Temple. <laughs> not for any hellish reasons. Um, I do it because they like to fuck with politicians who try to pretend that the separation of church and state isn't a thing. So, um, back. All right, now there are many flavors of black metal. For example, there is symphonic black metal, there is melodic black metal, there is folk black metal, there's pirate black metal, there's, there's, there's atmospheric black metal, there's depressive black metal, there's shoegaze black metal, there's psychedelic black metal, and progressive black metal, and there's un-black metal, <laughs> which is Christian black metal, because that makes sense. <laughs> but the most important thing I need for you to understand is that black metal is not death metal. Okay? Now, a lot of people think that death metal is just inherently more hardcore than black metal. Um, and this is wrong. <laughs> black metal can be very hazardous to your health. <laughs> it can cause dizziness, nausea, vomiting, stuttering, dry mouth, night sweats, nihilism, myopia, bitchiness, <laughs> senescence, topiary, <laughs> seeing ghosts, and ignoble passions. <laughs> But those of us who have built up an immunity to these things, we find that black metal is far more nuanced and expressive than death metal. All you're going to get from death metal is a um, sore throat the day after the concert. <laughs> now I first started getting into black metal, really into it, just shortly before I met my boyfriend, Phantom Black. <laughs> Do you know him? <laughs> Phantom Black? Oh. Um, he, his band is called Ibuprofane. <laughs> which is an awesome band name. Um, this, is, this is actually his guitar. Which I was going to play earlier, but that was on... I skipped it. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Santa is so hot when he plays. <laughs> I can't wait until he gets out in five to seven years. <laughs> Look, it's not his fault. <laughs> but you try to convince a judge that uh, a black metal band accidentally set fire to a church. <laughs> um, I would like now to direct your attention to this stunning visage. Um, this is called corpse paint. Um, I think the implication is obvious, but just in case you're tracking the world behind today, uh, this is used to invoke 
the dead or undead or demons. Um, <laughs> and, and possibly ironically, um, okay, ironically, uh, corpse state is not associated with death metal. It is, however, a staple of the black metal look. So just remember this. Black metal looks like death. Death metal looks sweaty. <laughs> Now, does, that, does anybody know who uh, originated, who pioneered the look of uh, corpse paint in rock music history? Alice Cooper. That is an excellent guess. <laughs> <laughs> You're wrong, but it's <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Don't say the keyword, please don't say the keyword. <laughs> Gene Simmons. Oh, that is so close to the keyword. <laughs> Recognize the name Arthur Brown? It's probably because his stage name was Arthur Brown. <laughs> <laughs> and even if the name doesn't ring a bell, you might recognize his hit song. Right? anymore, right? You can't go anywhere without seeing this. And it's not Texas. <laughs> um, now, this actually traces its origin back to a passage in the Bible. Um, it refers to goats, biblical goats. <laughs> we totally go see a concert by biblical goats. <laughs> the people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats the goats to his right and the sheep to his right <laughs> and the goats to his left presumably because the goats are are on their way straight to their eternal damnation because uh, historically speaking the left side is generally uh, considered wrong or even unclean, which is why to this day we are all suspicious of left-handed people. <laughs> Sorry, Paige. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. <laughs> um, so, if, you're, if you think your own thoughts and, 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 and you walk your own path, sort of like a goat's ornery, right, you're um, on the other side, though, is sheep, and sheep are obedient, and well, they're fucking sheep. <laughs> uh, but if you do your own thing, then you're a goat. If you do this, you rock! Now, it's pretty standard knowledge that who popularized this. Dio! Right? Dio! <laughs> <laughs> that sounded good. <laughs> Ronnie James Dio, yes, popularized this when he took over Fozzie Osborne in Black Sabbath. Um, now, he did not invent it. This was actually uh, a gesture that he borrowed from his Italian grandmother. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> she used this gesture. 
gesture to um, as protection from evil eye. Uh, so now, you know, it means all this like devil invocation stuff or whatever. Um, but then it meant protection from evil. <laughs> this sort of an evolution of a gesture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now you know the basics of big metal. And you didn't even have to listen to the music. Thank you. But. <laughs> just in case you live inside a cocoon, it sounds like this. the battle of the bands. 
between baby goddess <laughs> and scream feral, like like wild cat, <laughs> not like Will Ferrell. <laughs> feral, feral. Um, okay, so what's gonna happen? This is what you just agreed to do. Sorry. Uh, Brian is going to play a little sampler of your new hit. That's right about to drop. <laughs> He's gonna play a little, and you get to sing the song. We have a microphone for this. You get to sing the song. Just a few seconds, 15 seconds. Okay. Uh, just, but sell it, because these people are gonna vote by applause on which one they think should win. Black. Metal or bubblegum. Now, whoever wins the prizes, whatever happens to be in my pocket right now. If it's truth fully, that's probably the best thing to do. Okay, so now, first of all, I would like to introduce Baby Goddess. Rancid pink lights, I guess. <laughs> Rancid pink lights? Yeah. <laughs> you remember, this is the, the beaver part of the light. <laughs> Fireworks. Okay. Rancid pink lights, baby goddess, pop, bubblegum, crap, right now. Okay, go ahead. Saint Pat. 
Patrick's Day Club. <laughs> Well, there wasn't, 
much discussion. He said no, and we were just married, and I didn't want to cause trouble. And it wasn't long, long before I was pregnant anyway, and then I was too busy and really tired. <laughs> I kept playing music. Most Oh, Tiffany was in um, the orchestra, which was another part that I skipped. <laughs> um, I kept playing music, mostly for the kids. Only one really picked it up, saxophone in the marching band. She still plays, so it's nice to pass that on. You probably guess that music is one place where Dis and I do not see eye to eye. I mean, like, I like all kinds of music, but there's just some places I can't go. I'm more of a Beyonce, Ariana Grande fan. <laughs> <laughs> Head Dis is more... Well, there are no famous death metal bands, and there's a reason for that. I can never make her understand the difference between death metal and black metal. I try to make it as simple as possible. Death metal, the vocals are growled, and in black metal, there's also screaming. Just <laughs> <laughs> started wearing almost black and white makeup, and she called it corpse paint, like it's always Halloween or something. And I guess it looks cool, but I was worried about her. And then I kind of put it together. Because, you see, I am such a fan of Jim and the holograms. <laughs> <laughs> and Dis never understood that about me, so I figured it was kind of the same thing. I didn't understand her death metal. <laughs> and she didn't understand my Jim and the holograms. <laughs> so you know about Jim and the holograms. It was this awesome cartoon from the 80s about a girl and they made a movie a few years ago, and it's okay, but I just like the cartoon. So the holograms are Jem's band, and then there's like Jim, Jem's real life alter ego, Jerrica. And nobody knows that Jem and Jerrica are the same person, which is really dumb because her sister's in the band, but it's like a big secret that Jem is Jerrica. This makes no sense. <laughs> Jem and Jerrica are both dating Rio, and Rio's super jealous, and it's crazy because he's literally cheating on Jem with Jerrica, Jerrica with Jem. And he doesn't know they're the same woman. <laughs> and somehow, <laughs> Jem slash Jerrica doesn't seem to care. Okay, I never, I never actually listened to this part of the monologue because I was backstage um, changing for the knife throwing bit, <laughs> which we are not doing tonight. <laughs> um, she's obsessed with this children's cartoon. I mean. <laughs> Black metal music, at least that's interesting. <laughs> at least it's got, you know, Satan and death and the hell and the screams. And it's not about how Rio can't figure out the one, two women or one woman and one whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to skip to the end. My God, this goes on. Um, okay. <laughs> skip to the end. Um, my life changed two years ago when the youngest left to go to school in Colorado, and I've just been sitting there since then trying to figure out what I'm going to do. I don't have a career or anything, so what's my next step in life? I spent 25 years doing things for other people, queen of my tiny queendom. What do I do now for myself? So I was talking to Diz about French, and we started having all these ideas, and we were like, we should do a French show together. And because French is the right place, and you can do that, you can just say, let's do a show, and it can happen. <laughs> I was so excited because Diz is probably the most interesting person I know. And she's always wanted to do French. She's auditioned for it like three times, I think. I guess it didn't go so well, but I, I knew we could sing and we could be funny because even though we're kind of opposites, we're still best friends. And no matter what, we can always make each other laugh. We've always been sort of an odd couple, but we understand each other somehow. I guess that's what happens when you know someone as long as I've known Dis. She's the constant in my life. Um, I don't think there's anything more I can do without Megan.
been told I have anger issues. <laughs> anger and depression. Depression and anger. Which came first? Well. Um, I was a quiet kid. That's true. I was very shy and um, fragile. I needed to be treated gently, um, but the world doesn't do gentle very easily, very well. Sometimes I'll run across pictures from my childhood and I will get so curious on behalf of my child self. Because she doesn't know that she's already everything she needs to be. She, she doesn't know that she's valuable just because she is. And she's already learning that her job is to be quiet and follow directions and blend in and by all means don't make anybody uncomfortable. And um, soon she'll learn that her hair is wrong and her clothes are wrong and her body is wrong. And then she'll learn that Teachers and principals uh, don't know that an asshole teen is a teen in crisis. And she'll learn that being a virgin is shameful. But the second you have sex, you're a slut. And the only middle ground is being a tease, and that's by far the worst one. She'll learn that um, being vulnerable will scare people away. And covering that up and appearing tough will scare people away. <laughs> she'll learn that, um, she'll learn to pretend not care because caring hurts too much. And she will learn that she is unacceptable. She is not smart enough. She's not talented enough. She's not athletic enough. She's not fun enough, she's not funny enough, she's not crazy enough, she's not thin enough, she's not pretty enough, she's not enough. And then years later, decades, she'll realize that she was trying to feel this way about herself and um, She'll try to remember who she really is, and then she'll learn that that's at least as painful as learning to hide in the first place. Because hiding I read this once a blog. Um, and she was talking about the beauty products that she was taking with her to go to the hospital to deliver her child. You know, she, she wanted to look nice for the pictures with her newborn. And I, why shouldn't she? Right? This is a major turning point in her life and it's not like she can wear anything fancy. So the least she can do is like dress up her face, right? And um,
that she wants to look nice, look on tons of people are going to watch. I'm going to look at those pictures for a long time. And so she wants to look her best. Because obviously she's nice and marriage late hideous without makeup. I'm not, I'm not judging her. <laughs> I'm not judging her anymore than I would judge me. But why does she feel more confident wearing makeup? Or rather, why does she feel so unattractive without it that she can't even stand the thought of getting her picture taken after she has pushed a human being out of her body? <laughs> Giving birth is arguably the most feminine thing anybody can ever do, but that's not enough. She has to be pretty, too. She has to perform her gender. Women are, we're taught that we need to cover up the flaws that are our face, so we can be worthy of public consumption. As much as the makeup culture wants us to believe that it's a choice, women who don't wear makeup are not treated as well. You know, because there, there's got to be something wrong because we're not taking a few minutes to freshen up, look our best. No. So we must be lazy or trashy or depressed or sick or it's not enough that we just don't want to wear makeup. It's what not wearing makeup must mean. When I first started becoming dysmenorrhea, I um, I saw an opportunity to attack it from a different angle. Oh, you want me to wear makeup? Okay. <laughs> How's this, motherfuckers? <laughs> Do you like me now? I even my skin tone for you. I diminish the appearance of lines and wrinkles. Pro tip. Painting yourself to resemble a dead person can take years off your appearance. <laughs> maybe she's born with it. <laughs> and maybe it's righteous anger about being pummeled with the unrelenting message every waking moment that I'm not good enough so you can make money off of my self-hatred. We have to cover up what We have to play out the good things and downplay the bad things and look younger and disguise that we feel upset or tired or stressed or happy, happy, laugh lines, laugh lines. <laughs> Why would anybody ever want to get rid of something called laugh lines? An answer because young people don't have it. And so, even if it's remotely indicative of living a life full of laughter, they're definitely indicative of aging, and that's unattractive. So, we cover up first what we hate the most. Pimples, dark circles, and freckles, and scars, and accidents, and mistakes, and stories, and history, and um,
When we authentically apologize, we're, um, we're exposing ourselves. And it's scary. Oh. I think it's why kids so often are reluctant to say I'm sorry because it's so close to saying I did something ugly and this is what a bad person looks like. Adults take that and translate it into guilt and, um, and defensiveness and justification and finally anger at the source. <laughs> you, the other person, because how dare you put me in the position of having to confront something that I don't like about myself. But once we apologize, we're forgiven. I mean, that's that's what we're taught. That's how it goes. One person says, I'm sorry, and the other one, this person says, it's okay. Even if it's not. Even if it shouldn't be. We've made forgiveness mean that um, I absolve you of your sins against me. Okay. It'll have to be. <laughs> right. 
This is not how I expected this to go. <laughs> thank you all so much for coming. More to the point, thank you for staying. <laughs>